eyes closed. They do have ones that you can do with eyes open. But can you see the little light? Okay. The way this works, it's it's a two-way dial, but you gotta go all the way. You can go more intense, but if it's too intense and you want to make it lower, then hit it again and you'll go less intense. Yeah, 
So in other words, you gotta go all the way to the end of the line to come back to the beginning of the line. Okay? And the same thing with volume. You can increase or decrease the volume. So I'll start that in the back corner and then kind of, well, that's not a good idea because people in the middle get, get both at the same time. So I'll start over here. Okay? And like I said, don't use it if you don't want to. It's just there for fun if you want to see what it's like to experience it a little bit. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we're on time to begin this part. And, well, one of the discussions that we were having when they asked us what we can talk about it and what we could offer to this meeting, it was a big interest about trauma. And we know that trauma, emotional trauma, no uh, injury trauma, has been a hot topic lately, right? We are switching and paying more attention to emotional trauma, and now we, need, we are more aware of it, and as we are aware of it, we need to understand it better and learn more what we can help these individuals. So, as I mentioned in my introduction, I've been working lately with Bessel van der Kolk, and uh, I have a strong background in EEG, QEG, neurophysiology, epilepsy was my main condition that I studied, and thanks to Angelica and things that happened in life, I was connected to Bessel, and Bessel interviewed me and said, well, you have very strong background in neurophysiology, EEG neurofeedback. I say, yes. I say, what about trauma? I know nothing about trauma. <laughs> and he was, okay, don't worry. We have a team of 30 people that know trauma. We have nobody that knows EEG and neurophysiology, <laughs> so I think we can make a good team here. So he invited, he invited me to join at that moment, the trauma center, me knowing nothing about trauma, right? But what can happen? I came from neurological rehab. I was treating these very severe brain injuries, extremely severe. These cases that nobody wants to touch, they are very complicated cases. So I was treating these cases. So trauma, well, what can happen? I mean, I've been treating very hard cases. So I was like, okay, let's do this, right? And oh my gosh. <laughs> what I found it was extremely hard, complicated, dysregulated condition. And I'm still learning. I'm barely new in the area of trauma, just two years. So I have been very lucky to work with Inat. Inat Rogel is my colleague. Uh, we were running together the neurofeedback uh, clinic in Trauma Center, and a few months ago, we decided to open the private practice in Boston Neurodynamics. And Inat is it's, it's a clinician that has a lot of experience with trauma, so we combine very good, and she's teaching me a lot. I'm teaching her a lot. But I'm really today, just the voice of this lecture. She is the main author of this lecture, and I'm very lucky to present the data of two main studies today about neurofeedback at trauma. The first study that I'm going to, to show the results is a study that is already published in PTSD and neurofeedback. Uh, the principal investigator is Bessel van der Kolk, and you found this data already published. It was a very good study that really break through, break through like the information of how we can use neurofeedback in trauma. Bessel has been a real visionary helping to understand or, or to educate professionals to use and implement neurofeedback for trauma. So uh, it has been very helpful to, in that direction. And the second study that I'm going to show the results is still unpublished. Okay, so you are probably to be not the first audience, probably the third audience that see this data. 
And hopefully, very soon, the authors can get a, a published, very nice published report, uh, paper. Uh, so it will be there. OK, so let's learn more about trauma, right? So what we knew or know about trauma is that we have a DSM criteria for PTSD, right? And we know this is the main criteria for PTSD diagnosis and if somebody that has been experienced some uh, injury or sexual violence or, or in other many ways, directly or witness or, okay, or uh, learning that other family members uh, were exposed to trauma or experience a re repeated extreme exposure to adverse details in traumatic events. So it could be violence, natural disasters, divorce, being separated from parents, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but what is different between developmental trauma and PTSD? And this is the, a big awareness that we want to raise. There is a huge difference between being exposed your brain was developed in a normal way, and all the circuits were connected in a normal way during childhood, and then you were exposed to emotional situation that provoked all these symptoms that we're going to discuss, right? Different developmental trauma that we need to consider as a separate entity, as a separate uh, diagnosis. And in many ways it's different, okay? So this is what I was talking about, that PTSD, there is a line, right, before and after, and what happened. In developmental trauma, what happened is that chronic exposure to the trauma, violence, abuse, neglected in early age, right? And we know right now it's a huge public health challenge of the consequences of being exposed to uh, trauma in childhood. It can affect the well-being, mental, neuronal development. And the child abuse, we need to consider in many different levels, right? It could be physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional, neglect, interpersonal violence, community violence, intimate partner violence, bullying. Now we know very strong about bullying, right? We're identifying how, how um, important and how much can be the effects of bullying in developmental trauma. And we were talking about attachment. I was right now in lunch giving half of this lecture. <laughs> so I was very happy that the, the audience was so aware about it and they mentioned about attachment, right? What happened during childhood? The brain of the baby is learning from the surrounding environment and the connection with adults and other family members and people around them is so important to develop healthy circuits. So to be engaged in communication with adults is really huge for this brain that is learning and developing, okay? So it's not only just looking to them is really responding to their emotions and in an emotional way. And we're learning more and more about these experiments and these uh, clinical trials about the still face. Are you familiar with this experiment with the still face? Yeah. Uh, usually I not with this video and it's very nice representation of how the children can immediately, and this video is so remarkable how the kid, the, the toddler, is starting having some emotional response to an adult that is in front of them, but they are not responding emotionally, right? And this is what happened in developmental trauma. And the brain is developing all these processes, right? How to have feelings with others, how you are knowing what you are doing on yourself. It's a lot of learning how they are interacting. So when we have 
uh, mental health parent that uh, with mental a parent with a mental health issue, right? That they cannot have appropriate attachment and appropriate emotional uh, connection. This is already affecting how the brain of the baby or the kid is developing. So what I was most impressed when I started learning about trauma is how little we are aware or we really ask about trauma to our patients, right? We think that trauma has to be something very strong, like a huge event that really happened in their lives. And this study, with thousands of, of children, uh, they were just counting how many trauma, how many experienced trauma they have through their lives, right? And they found that 75% of this population that they studied could, were exposed to multiple experiences of trauma, 25% at least one, okay? So, of course, now that we are learning all that in our clinical intake, we need to have a huge part that we ask about trauma exposure, right? And at different levels. Because we know it can have effect in all these levels. Academic difficulties, behavioral difficulties, attachment problems, suicidal, sub substance abuse is very, very big. The Adverse Childhood Experience Study, I think many of you are aware of this study, is like a must to show in a lecture like this. It was a, a very large study where they uh, follow 17,000 um, uh, adults and they measure how many uh, traumas they experienced during childhood and what was the effect of that. Okay, as an adult, what was your clinical uh, effect of being exposed to different emotional trauma during childhood. And these are all the types of childhood events that were measured, uh, emotional, physical, sexual, neglect, and all these different household challenges, right? And if you see here, I mean, they're very common, right? In many societies at any economical level, I could say. So from this study, these were the percentage that they found exposed to the uh, trauma events or trauma exposures, and overall 52% uh, were in these categories. And they have very nice graphs of this study where you can see exactly what is the level of how many trauma exposures they were exposed. But this is, I think, the most representative. What is the effect, what is the impact of this exposure to trauma during life, right? So, of course, it can disrupt neural development. We can evaluate these children, how they, all the developmental skills are in different rates, social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. They are having higher health risks, uh, behaviors, diseases, disabilities, social problems and early death. So if you read um, Bessel van der Kolk's book, he's talking about the body, right? And how the body is paying the price of being exposed to, to emotional trauma during childhood. And this is where we then understand why we can have had seen effects in health health-related issues. And so, how is this related? Why do they get sicker? Why do they have all these autoimmune in, 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 in diseases? Why they are more prone to have uh, substance abuse, etc.? So, now we understand better. So, the population that is in higher risk for developmental trauma is parents that are young, with low education, single parenthood, large number of dependent children, low income, history of abuse of mental illness, poor parenting skills, uh, if they transit for other uh, caretakers, communities with violence and poverty, chronic medical problems, special needs. 
And this sounds like quite straightforward, right, Jess? This sounds like hard to raise a kid in this situation. But there are many other situations that we don't even imagine that could be a problem in this family, in this community. So we really need to ask for it, ask for that very, uh, in very detail. And, um, oh, yeah, we're going to talk more about adoption during this lecture. But yeah, we know that whatever it happened before this kid is adopted, right? The older they get adopted, of course, it's going to be harder. But sometimes we see kids, babies, that are adopted in months old. And the months previous to before being adopted, they already were exposed to too severe trauma. And this will have an impact for the rest of their lives, for the rest of their lives. And these parents are so enthusiastic about adopting the children and they will fold the kid of love, they will give them everything they will need, they will have the happiest life ever, and they will be the most successful parents and happy parents to have a kid. And what we know now, it doesn't matter how much love you can give this kid or how much resources or how much support, right? The damage and the problem was these stages that he didn't have the care and it will be very hard to regulate and go back to normal. So it has a huge impact on difficulties and all depends of the age and all depends of what level of, of stress it was exposed. Now we know all the neurophysiology components of developmental trauma. We know about hormonal uh, abnormalities, the cortisol is increased in maltreated children and decrease in adults with PTSD. So there is a difference. We are understanding that the stress is different in children than in adults, right? And we know that when a children is separated from the mother for the mother just went to the bathroom. But the kid doesn't know that. <laughs> the kid doesn't know that the mother is only in the bathroom. For the kid, it's already a huge, huge, huge loss. He doesn't know if the mother is coming back. And the baby is already very stressed. It's my mother, my, my only attachment to be alive is going to be back and save me and protect me, right? So we need to understand all the stress that is processing this child, even for short periods of time. And this can affect all the physiology and regulation. Um, increase in acute response and decrease develops over time due to developmental trauma effects of trauma. And here I want to make a comment of my clinical experience treating trauma is that these children that grew up in such an uh, alert and over activity stages, right? So they needed the survival mode was already all the time on. They needed to be ready to survive, to run, to save their lives, all their childhood. <laughs> so all the adrenaline, all the hormones or the physiology is so activated all the time, nonstop, okay? And then they are adults and they are trying to cope with life and when they have this very <coughs> adrenaline experience, they feel nothing. This is a normal state. <laughs> so I have patients that I say, oh, I just went skydiving and I love it and it's amazing. And I was like, well, but I mean, it's, it's like kind of it's a lot of adrenaline. It's a lot of, how, what do you feel? Nothing, nothing. I can skydive. And it's my normal mode, okay? So for me, this was a very good to understand what these people live. What is the normal state for them? It's like they are constantly skydiving, right? And this is what their body is responding all the time. So of course there is an adrenal response and effect. All the hormones are so active. And of course there is a moment that they reach a plateau and then they go down. Um, 
and there is also effect during puberty, huge effects during puberty. When we have adopted children, and they are, well, we're trying to help these parents about how to introduce more interventions and more therapy, and it's before reaching the teenagers, we said, you need to do something right now. Because when they get to teenager brain, it's another level of difficulty. Right now, we're going to face many other obstacles that happen uh, in the neurobiology of the teenager brain. So the impact of developmental trauma during childhood affects all the neural systems in the brain and compromise the functional capacity mediated by these systems. So what we, what we are measuring, what we are learning about the physiology and the brain of these cases, well, we are understanding that the brain is working differently. When we are recording a QEG of a, 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 an adult, let's say a teenager adult that survived childhood uh, trauma, is going to be definitely different of a child, of, a, of, a, of an adult that didn't live that experience. And this is what I was exp explaining before. The brain of a children supposed to be developing in a secure, calm, protected environment. So the brain needs to be focused on how they need to develop. I need to develop in social skills. I need to develop in um, other type of learning, motor learning, etc. All the things that the child needs to develop. These kids are just protecting themselves. The brain is just, you know, forget about learning. Who wants to learn? Let's be alive. Forget about learning that and these other skills. Socializing, this is not our priority. We need to keep alive this person and this brain. So this is what is wiring in this, in this, in this brain. So it's dif dif definitely different. And we don't have yet the neuromarkers that we are looking for developmental trauma. We are, we are having uh, very soon more research studies that we can find in a QEG this is a brain that suffered developmental trauma. And we're very close to that. I think we, it's very evident, way evident that I could say with other conditions. It's very localized, limbic system regions. There are very specific regions of the brain that we know they are affected during neurodevelopment. We also have another component, the event-related potentials. The event-related potentials is another neurophysiological measure. It helps us to understand how this brain is processing sensory information. So in QEG, we're just measuring electrical activity, uh, uh, constant electrical activity. The brain is producing this activity by itself. The event-related potential is a response to a stimuli. So it could be a visual stimulus, sensory, motor, cognitive stimulus, and then we're going to measure how this brain is responding. So it will help us to understand way better why they are processing sensory information so different. Okay? And this is very common in trauma. And when we're measuring ERPs, we understand and we <laughs> have the objective measure that this is true. This person is feeling different, is hearing different. They see the things different. And of course, cognitively, they function different. The sensory processing is way different from a normal developed brain. So now with the HBI and the Brain Arc um, uh, project, we want to get better understanding of that so we will be able to target more precise interventions for this population. So here what we can see is an ERP of a normal brain developed. So they have a stimuli, and this is a normal P100, P200, P300 response, and this is a PTSD brain, right? So they respond all over the place, not in the direction they should know, they should go, and there is a reason why. 
for each of them. Okay, now I'm going to show you the results of the adult study. This was, uh, it was published, I think, almost two years ago. But of course, I'm going to show you 10 slides <laughs> of probably a six years project. And um, uh, it was done in trauma center and it was the first study that was done in neurofeedback and trauma. Um, this was in adults. So the goal, it was to help them to, uh, with developmental trauma who are stuck. Do you remember I was mentioning stuck um, and we will mention it in more detail in the next lecture. But really this is what happened with trauma. They try many different therapies as an adult. They come to look for us after minimum 10 different therapies. And they are in the same place. They are not moving forward. They are still remaining a lot of issues. So we want them to help them to be unstuck and keep looking forward for improving. So in this study, this was a random study. They have 52 individuals diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, PTSD because it's a, the diagnosis that is accepted so far. They were randomly assigned to a group of neurofeedback or a waiting list. They have two times evaluation, a baseline, after six weeks, post-treatment, and after a month of follow-up. The inclusion criteria, they needed to be 18 and up. They needed to fill the criteria for PTSD in the DSM or by the uh, CAPS scale. These were all the exclusion criteria. I think something important, well, I think these are very standard. That were people that could not uh, uh, participate in the study. And this was, and still, very, one of our biggest research questions. What type of protocol we can do for PTSD neurofeedback? This is research, and for research, the ideal is to have a standard protocol for everybody, okay? So even if we have QEGs, and I will talk about the QEG, we couldn't do individualized protocol, okay? Now there is, we are trying to figure out if this could be an option to have individualized protocol, but for these purposes they need to put the standard protocol for all the subjects. So this is why they did the 4 p It's well known that the limbic system is involved in trauma, the temporal parietal conjunction is one of the spots where uh, we have seen more abnormalities in the QEGs of adults with developmental trauma. And there is bibliography, neurophysiolog neurophysiological uh, background that guide us more to do it on the right than on the left. But lately we have found something different, but well, this is what they did in this study. These were the frequencies that were trained, uh, two bands inhibition and one band rewarding. They did twice a week for 12 weeks total of 24 sessions. They did all these questionnaires and inventory. This was a really a big effort. Uh, of course, all related with uh, PTSD symptoms. And um, these other uh, scales. Okay, so there's the results of the PTSD criteria comparing with the warning list group, this is the, the evaluations that were done baseline, post, and follow-up, right? So we can see that there is a huge reduction, a statistical significant reduction of the criteria of PTSD in the treatment group, and they really stay very stable after the follow-up. This is a warning list. We are not surprised that even that they didn't get, get the intervention we see some effect, even that they, they didn't even have sham. This was just waiting list, just people that was measured. And we can get into, there is a lot of, of uh, information we can provide why this happened. Expectation and some kind of placebo, etc. 
Um, in the different other scales that were measured, we see very good um, improvements in all these scales, affected regulation, skills deficits, affect instability, uh, abandoned concerns, all these were a statistical improve in all the clinical uh, evaluation. There was a profound effect on the executive functioning. And this is a big question that we have. What, why were having effect on the frontal lobes? It were training of the back of the brain. <laughs> Right? And all of you probably experienced that if you're a clinician. If you have, you are training one part of the brain, but we're seeing improvement in functions that are located in another part of the brain. And yeah, it makes sense. If we help this brain to calm down the limbic system and teach this brain, you know, you don't have to be in survival mode. You are finally in a protected environment and you can rest. Then the frontal lobe will be, okay, now I can function, now I can make better decisions, and now I can plan organize better because I don't have to be in the active survival way all the time, okay? And we can show that in QEG maps. We can see just regulating the limbic system posterior part of the brain, we see boom, improvement in the frontal lobe. And of course, the brain is a net, all this connectivity and and um, structures that connect with each other, but this is basically the, the main reason. So we saw improvements in planning, decision making, a correction, mental flexibility. This is huge in trauma, huge. They are so stuck and so rigid in how they think and so little limit on, on, on getting upset or sad or so just having more flexibility is very, very beneficial in their lives. Dealing with danger um, and impulsivity, self-regulation. So this is the author of the paper. Here it is. So more results. Inhibition, shift. This is all the brief, the brief subscale, the, the executive functioning. All positive results. It was really a positive study. <laughs> All very, very dramatic and very um, good results with 24 sessions of neurofeedback. Only one participant had side effects, flashbacks. Okay, this was good. They were lucky. <laughs> now, they finished that study and then they say, okay, it's very nice that we can help adults. Of course, we want to help everybody. But if we can help children, we can really direct them in a different way in their lives, right? Actually, Besser van der Kolk's goal is to really help the children to stop helping them dragging all these difficulties through their lives and they can have more productive adulthood. Um, so they say, okay, let's do children. That was the next research question. Can we do the same with children? Can we, this is a big question that we have. If the brain is still in development, can we reverse some of the neurodevelopmental issues that happen in this brain? Okay, we don't know yet, we're <laughs> trying to understand. So they did again a randomized uh, study, and again, this is another four or five years effort and yeah, so they have very successful results with the adult study. Now we want to see if what children is any different. So they have a population of 6 to 13 years old, children that suffer at least two types of trauma, that they have uh, significant symptoms in these uh, scales, in the CVCL and the post-traumatic stress symptoms. Uh, stable in all conditions, in medications, therapy, etc. commitment with the study. That this was very difficult <laughs> to find the subject that they were committed. They have some exclusion criteria, uh, just basic if they have other medical conditions, other type of medications, or they have life-threatening situations, so they live very far. 
So these were the demographics of the, of the subjects, 37 subjects. And everything is pretty stable in this study. Uh, just here, that most of the population, they were adopted. Okay, they were only like uh, uh, one or two uh, uh, kids that lived with uh, their biological parents. So, yeah, we find this very common in adopted uh, population. They will have probably the first, I don't know, if there are clinical trials that show different responses in gender differences, they are going, part of the results of this study is there, there was a gender difference response to neurofeedback, so stay tuned for that result. So this was a trauma profile for the subjects. In average, of 14 participants experienced one type of trauma, average of seven different types of trauma per participant. So yeah, more than two, so I, I don't think you can read all of that, but this is at least of all, mostly, um, um, oh my God, not even me, I can read. <laughs> so separation, neglect, Impaired caregiver, emotional abuse, physical maltreatment, domestic violence, uh, traumatic loss, etc. Okay, and this is how they uh, randomized the groups, how they did the screens, they were all evaluated, they divided in a waiting list and then in an active group. The waiting list after this, this the, the, the they completed the evaluations. They were offered to do the active treatment, but um, it was after they completed the evaluation. So I think this was something very nice to consider from, the, from this research. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, here we mentioned that they have also the three measurements, the, be the, the beginning baseline, post-treatment, and follow-up. They replicated the same protocol. They did the same protocol T4, T4. Uh, the difference was that was, uh, they were rewarding the band three from one hertz below the posterior dominant rhythm. Uh, in age six to 13, the brain still in development, so the posterior dominant rhythm still changes, right? So this is the most accurate way to find what is a PDR for the, the posterior dominant rhythm for the subject. They did a slow inhibition band and a high inhibition band. And the, the length of the session, the aim was to do the training for 30 minutes. Okay? I will talk about what happened <laughs> because not everybody could achieve the 30 minutes, but that was the goal. And uh, they were twice a week for 24 sessions. Oh, actually, here is the note. In reality, sessions were between 12, 6 to 12 minutes. And this was probably the most shocking thing that I learned with trauma. How short the sessions needed to be when you are regulating a brain with trauma. They are so sensitive and respond so fast, or for good or for bad. <laughs> we're talk going to talk about it. So you need to be very careful with the time of the training because the brain reacts very, very fast. Okay, so these are the different assessments that were measured. They have a lot of different, very specific questionnaires. So here's the results. After 24 sessions, there were statistical significant improves in the symptoms of children with developmental trauma in all these scales. Behavioral, cognition, emotion, trauma-related, dissociation, alexithymia. Alexithymia is their ability to express their feelings. So this is in trauma. They are so separated. They don't understand what is going on. They, when you ask them, what do you feel? Plain. They don't know. So to be able to express how they feel is actually one of the skills that show more significant, more statistical significant. I was telling them they need to publish those, just the results of this scale because it was so remarkable. I'm going just to screen and show you all these graphs. How this, this is the baseline, this is post, and this is 
after the follow-up. Okay, and this is the waiting group and this is the active group. And what happened? There was a very nice improvement during the treatment, but once they stop the training, they have a little bit of regression, a little bit. Some scales could be statistical significant, the, re the regression, some of them not, but we are going to see this shape in all the scales, going down and then up again, a little bit. So we are learning a lot about this, and the first takeaway is 24 sessions was not enough. Right? Now, the, only th the, the other thing that we keep looking is that we're seeing it less than in adult study, where we are seeing also some effect in the, wait in, the waiting, in the waiting list, but this got even worse, right? Or they were flat as well. So this is the brief, this is executive functioning uh, and behavioral regulation, a little bit of regression, metacognition, a behavioral checklist, internalizing, alexithymia. This is, was very, very nice. When you see the different measures of alexithymia was very nice. Trauma symptoms, uh, anxiety, depression, arousal, dissociation, and affective disorders. This was a little bit more severe afterwards, right? Okay, so it was a really nice study. We learned a lot from that. But yes, we, decide, we, we know 24 sessions is not enough. And we have so many questions for the next research. <laughs> we have so many questions that we want to answer. And we will begin our next uh, clinical trial in January. So we need really to put all our heads together in what are going to be our research questions. Um, now, QEG, what happened with QEG, right? And this is where we get in a big fight, the QEG oriental clinicians with the no QEG oriental clinician. When I arrived there, they were already finalizing all these results, and they said, well, look, we have all this QEG data. Can you help us to do the analysis? I said, sure, we're going to find so good results. It's going to be so good. And we're doing all this analysis and not finding much difference, and not finding much difference, and <laughs> not finding much difference as a group level. Okay, yes, it's a short number of subjects. It's probably a big limitation. And, um, but we still convinced that we are going to be able to publish in some degree because in an individual level, we saw so many changes. Most of the cases, they show differences, but it's not like in the same frequency band and it's not in the same location and it's not in the same uh, uh, analysis. So these are the variables that are uh, getting in our way to have a good uh, statistical results. But we see that this is just one of the cases. Uh, this is pre-neurofeedback, this is post, and we just see the excess of theta. And now we see a, a significant regulation of excess of theta. And exactly in the regions that was trained, right, in P44. And uh, this is one way, other type of improvements that we see probably, what I showed you was um, um, absolute, absolute power, and this is coherence values. And in this case, we didn't see any changes in, in absolute powers, but we see improvements in coherence. When there was an excess of coherence in theta band, and this is post-intervention, right? So this is where we were finding, and we're trying to figure it out uh, what we can show in this data. And this is why we learn also that we need more neurophysiological measures and our next uh, study, we will add ERPs components so we can have more to explore and expand uh, what we learn in, this, in these cases. Uh, I really like all the quality and personal reports from the subjects and their parents. Right? 
And this is why the experience that at the end, yes, we need the research. And this is a very important component. But at the end, we want to have a better human being, whoever we are helping. And we want to do better in life. And looks like this study uh, uh, achieved that. Uh, mother was, was so pleasant with, to be with this kid, didn't have meltdowns, uh, this is great. She turned to be a person, right? And all this, this has been extremely beneficial for my son and me. Mm. So this is very common. He still swears at me, but we work on the strategies to stop it. It takes him shorter time to recover, and these episodes are not as severe. He was crying and said he was sad. So this is very common, that probably the symptoms or the responses won't totally disappear, but they will have better resources to self-regulate and understand. But before, it doesn't matter what you tell them. There, there's no way. Then children's reports. My sleep is better. It makes sense what the teacher was saying before it was blurry. I feel relaxed and calm. I like to calm. It helps me. I feel better. I don't think I could go to the camp without neurofeedback. Uh, I don't feel this child report after a year post neurofeedback. I don't feel calm. I feel more nervous. I want to continue neurofeedback. So something that was also very nice in this study all the subjects love to come to neurofeedback. All of them. They are happy and enthusiastic. And they, and I think different from other conditions, treating other conditions, I think, I think they are more aware or they can see more their challenges in life. And when they see that they are getting better, they are definitely enthusiastic to come and see that it's helping them. But, unfortunately, <laughs> this is something that we are also learning more and more, that we have high risk, it's a population of very high risk to have adverse reaction. They are so sensitive, their brain responds so fast, they are so um, reactive to the change that is happening in the neurofeedback that they can have uh, adverse reaction, headaches, tiredness, sleep disturbances, affecting their attention, impulsivity, behavior, adverse moods, or increasing in the anxiety. Yeah? And they found that sessions longer than 6 to 12 minutes, it could have more higher side effects. The good news is that we can address them and resolve them, right? This is why we need very good feedback from this, this client, well, from every client, but this in particular, we need to have very clear feedback so we can help them to reverse the side effects. And unfortunately, these are clients that are not very good reporters. They won't tell you in detail. They won't, they don't know what happened. They don't feel it, they don't understand it. So it's very difficult to take all the information from them. So this is when we have to have more resources or how to track their progress. And we have to be very specific what we are measuring, what they have to write, what they have to let us know. So, um, oh, this is a poor reporting. Also, we learned that it's essential to combine neurofeedback with other therapy. Neurofeedback, or actually any biofeedback technique, we understand that we are working at the physiological level, right? We are helping to self-regulate and modify physiology to reduce the symptom. But whatever is happening, emotion, this, we, this, we're going to be able to change it. But we're not going to be able to change the past, or their parents, or the school, or the teacher. This is still there, <laughs> and they have to deal with it. Or life, or stressors in life, they are going to continue being there. So this is where we need the therapist backup, okay? Because this will continue being there. Neurofeedback, biofeedback is helping to regulate, and more things are going to come up. In trauma, it's very, very important to have side-by-side -side therapy. And at the beginning, 
they are very resistant to, oh, I've been done this for years. I don't want to go back to therapy. This is why I'm looking for neurofeedback, because I don't have to talk. I don't have to go again through all my trauma. I don't want to go through my trauma again. I want just to do that, right? And we're not just telling the oh, yes, you have to go to talk therapy and go talk about the trauma. No, we're trying to help them to identify other sources of trauma therapy without being that talk therapy. Sensory, motor, EMDR, other type of, of therapy that can be helpful for them to get all the benefits of neurofeedback. But we need definitely the, the backup of the therapy. In the study, what happened is that sensitive information was disclosed during the sessions. Suicidal thoughts, gender issues. And we were just doing a neurofeedback session. We cannot address all that, so this is why and probably these ideas were not at the surface level before start on starting neurofeedback, right? So neurofeedback helped them to develop and get these emotions and, 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 and situations to heal in a more, surf yeah, in another level to be processed. Increase emotions, um, and yeah, it can be affected to therapy. And somebody else here told me, yeah, when you can actually have severe side effects if you don't combine uh, other therapy with neurofeedback. And also we learned 24 sessions is not enough, right? And this is from many questions that, that we have about neurofeedback. This is probably one of the biggest ones that we don't know. How many sessions do we need? Right? This is the first question that your client will ask you. How many sessions I will need? This is hard to, an to answer. We will address it a little bit after in the next lecture. Um, so, yeah, so this is how you need to keep track of all the neurofeedback changes, having checklists or logs that would be very helpful. And of course, outside, the uh, protocol, you need to adjust the protocol as they are reporting to you. I supervise clinics internationally and with less trauma, more like more neurological conditions. And the patients that I switch and change and modify protocols more often is trauma-oriented patients because they react so fast and like, oh no, we need to reduce that. No, change the side here didn't respond well, now let's do it again. So it's a lot of really understanding and knowing more about this brain to see what we can do and see how they will respond. Um, the challenges of the study, more, most participants were treatment resistant, so they sent all the, the, the patients that didn't respond to other therapies, um, addressing increasing intense emotions like depression, uh, at the beginning, challenges, they didn't want to come. Placing the electrodes in children that were too sensitive to touch, this is a highly sensitive uh, population as well, and engaging children. Also, that was probably my first time that I have the most difficult experience recording a QEEG. And I have experience with autism, okay? So I was like, well, I've been doing an autism. I can do it in a trauma child. <laughs> they are so sensitive. Like, this is painful. And it's pa real pain. <laughs> Nothing that they are making it up. It's real pain for them. So it's really, really a challenge with the sensory issues. The limitations of the study uh, are the demographic. Most of the participants were adopted who live in the middle upper class family. Uh, our goal, hopefully, we can get to the kids that are in more need. Um, and this was a pilot study, small number of participants, small number of sessions, large variability, in different types of trauma, ages, multiple inclusion criteria, and one protocol. We only use one protocol independently of the QEG. Challenges that we still face with neurofeedback, we wish we can understand more and more about the mechanism at the molecular level and the network level Need more research, basic research. Students, here is your homework. 
length of sessions, frequency of sessions, uh, we don't know. It's better to train them twice a week, three, six, once a month. Well, not once a month for sure we don't know, but uh, oh, this is what I was telling about your commercial companies and black boxes, all these devices that they don't tell us what they do, <laughs> but just buy it. And all technology they, uh, that are not friendly interfaces and problems with amplifiers and, and wires and games. We need, this is, this is one of our goals uh, for the research uh, protocol. We are going to look for neuromarkers in developmental trauma. So I want you to understand that Childhood de developmental trauma is different from adult PTSD, and all these are the different uh, um, emotional uh, factors that we have to consider. Every culture is different. There are cultures that will be more open to talk about it and tell you. There are many other cultures or education levels that they, they won't tell you at all. I found lately in Mexico, with my, with my patients in Mexico, that you really need to be a detective to find for trauma. They will never tell you, never. It's just everything so nice, parents are the best people in the world, uh, kids are doing great, just they don't regulate emotionally, we don't know why. It can be genetics, yeah, it's a component, but what is going on? So you really need to, Scratch, 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 and you find it out. Eventually, you find it out. And this kid has been abused, right? Doesn't have to be a severe abuse. Emotional, psychological abuse in a low level will have a huge impact. So, yeah, we need to. I'm talking to Vessel and to all these great researchers and everybody. Now we understand better trauma, we understand better what is going on. We are finding interventions to help them. Very fast, we need to move to educate the population to prevent trauma. Because in Mexico, or probably many other places, there's no better way to, to educate kids. We need to hit them. And this is why we have the belt. <laughs> and this is why we have the shoe. And this is normal. We all were raised like that. And look, we're here. We're fine, right? But yes, what about your anxiety and your sleep issues and your health issues and your... So we really need to educate better parents and community that how we are raising the kids is having a huge impact and how interacting and attachment and spend time with them and taking care of their emotions and respond on time and be there. It has a huge impact in how these brains are developing. And people don't know better. Right, so I think this is, a, this is our next job to help to educate the people. Well, very thankful to be part of this group. As I told you, I'm just the boys here and happy to, they were so excited. Yes, please, show all the slides, spread the word. They are really eager to, to um, spread the word, to try to get with more uh, people interested in these projects. Uh, we are going to start a new trial in the new trauma center, clinical trial, and we're just looking for contacts, uh, people that want to collaborate. Uh, if we have other spots, there are people here that know about uh, what is happening in the border with separation of the kids. We want to go to the, go there. They said that is very hard, but if you know any any need to help children that has been exposed to trauma, and we have the options to help, please let us know. We are really, really looking forward to, to help this population. Okay, this is Boston. Anytime you want to come and visit. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we have a lot of time. Yeah, we're gonna take a little 10 minute break. Okay. When we come back, we're gonna do some stretching exercises. And, uh, Do you think we have time for questions? I will be. I mean, after the break or sure, before, sure. I would like to have more interactive. <laughs> Absolutely. If it's possible. Absolutely, they can get the mic um, yeah, and ask yeah. questions. Um, we're going to do some awards real quick and do some some stretching exercises, and you're going to enjoy it. 
and then you're going to wake up, and then we're going to continue with questions and the next presentation. So 10 minutes. Hello. Thank you. 